Well, I first heard Karen Russell on NPR uh, being interviewed on Fresh Air. And as soon as I heard her read from the title story of her short story collection, St. Lucy's Home for Girls Who Were Raised by Wolves, I said, we must bring this person to campus for the Contemporary Writers Series. Um, I immediately ran out and, and bought the book. And it was one of those books, there are very few writers where I will sit down and stop myself from reading because I'm enjoying it so much. I read one story a night and I said, I'm not going to read two. I'd love to read two, but I'm just going to read one because I don't want to spoil tomorrow night when I can read another one. And I savored that work uh, from night to night. And she received tremendous attention for this story collection. The genre is magical realism, which is not a popular genre in English, but it's very popular in South uh, American lit. And it, as she and I, we, we met last spring in New York and had coffee uh, and uh, chatted about her coming here. And we were talking about this uh, phenomenon that actually that kind of story, when mythological creatures come to life, is much, much older than realism. And if you look at what we think of as realistic fiction, it's a fairly short life, you know, just maybe the last 150 years. So she's working in an older tradition of characters like the Minotaur, of werewolves, of, uh, or at least girls who were raised by wolves, and um, putting them in our time, which makes sense. If you think of the ancient Greeks, when they were writing the original stories about Minotaurs, they were set in their own time. So what would happen if a character out of mythology plunked itself down in 20th century America. And that's kind of the starting point uh, of Karen's work. More importantly, I think, as a writer, she has one of the best ears for language that I've come across in a long time. Um, those of us that are writers admire writers who can choose just the right word, just the right word. And I found myself stopping at many points and saying, wow, that's the only word that could fit there. And so um, she's a technician. You know, somebody once said to Miles Davis, Miles, you don't play many notes. If you know Miles, cool jazz, right? Miles said, no, but I play the right ones. And I think Karen's that way in her writing. She chooses the right words. And that's important. So this story, this collection of stories, St. Lucy's Home, for Girls Raised by Wolves was named a best book by the Chicago Trib, the San Francisco Chronicle, the Los Angeles Times. 2007, she was featured in the New Yorker's debut fiction uh, issue in Granta, which is a really prestige British uh, literary magazine, as one of the best of young American novelists. In the collections uh, in 2007 and 2008 of the best American short stories, she was chosen, one of her stories was chosen first by Stephen King in 2007 and in 2008 by Salman Rushdie as one of the best short stories of those years. She currently makes her home in Washington Heights, New York City, where she uh, got her um, MFA degree from Columbia University and teaches there part-time uh, on and off. Currently, she's at Williams College in Massachusetts, one of the premier liberal arts colleges, doing a semester residency. And next fall, we'll be back at Columbia as an adjunct. Uh, I'm very excited to bring her here. I, th I hope you will be as well. And please welcome Karen Russell. Hi, guys. What a beautiful introduction. Um, I feel like I want to be like subsumed into the heavens now. That was just the most stunning, uh, kindest introduction. I have been looking forward to this reading with you guys for over a year now. Um, when Gary, when I first got Gary's email, um, so it's like a total thrill uh, to be here. I'm so grateful to Linda and Tony, and to Pam and Gary for having me out. Um, and I thought, uh, I guess uh, this story is that I'm going to read tonight is sort of a long one. Um, and it is about the Minotaur, and it started out as this sort of terrible idea, as many of my stories do, that everyone told me not to write. Um, I think I actually, we had been watching a documentary about um, the Oregon Trail, and I really think I might have just I turned to uh, my boyfriend at the time and said, yeah, wouldn't it be funny if the Minotaur pulled one of those wagons out west, and as he frequently did, he like rolled his eyes and was like, don't write anything about that, that sounds terrible. Um, but the image really stayed with me, you know, of this, um, this mythological creature uh, in the American West 
And it seems sort of hilarious, but there was some, something tragic about it and something that felt really emotionally true to me too. Um, so anyway, this is the story that, uh, that grew out of that image. Um, and thank you guys again for having me. All right, so this is um, from Children's Reminiscences of the Westward Migration. There's a little epigraph that I found. Um, in the winter, our mother got hold of Fremont's history of the Western territories and brought the book to my father to read, and he was carried away with the idea. Mother said, oh, let us not go. My father, the Minotaur, is more obdurate than any man. Sure, it was his decision to sell the farm and hitch himself to a 4,000 pound prairie schooner and head out west. But our road forked a long time ago, months before we ever yoked dad to the wagon. If my father was the apple biter, my mother was his temptress Eve. It was Ma who showed him the book, Fremont's Almanac of Uninhabited Lands. Miss Tortelot, one of the fusty old biddies in her sewing circle had lent it to mom as a curiosity. It contained 18 true life accounts of emigrants on the overland trail, coupons for quinine and barley corn, and speculative maps of the Western territories. The first page was a watercolor of the new country, a paradise of clover and golden stubble fields. The sky was dusky pink, daubed with fat little doves. In the central oval, right where you would expect to find a human settlement, there was nothing but a green vacuity. Unflattened pasture, the caption read, free for the takers. Can you imagine, Asterion? My mother smiled like a girl, letting her finger drowse over the page. All that land and no people. You could tell that even my mother, in spite of her sallow practicality, was charmed by the idea. Easy winters, canyon springs. No one to tell the old stories about her husband or to poke fun at his graying, woolly bull head. She let her finger settle on the word free, the deed to an invisible life. She traced the spiky outline of the mountains, a fence that no church lady could peer over. Look at that, son, my father grinned. More grass than I could eat in a lifetime. All that space for your ball place. Now, wouldn't you want to live there? I frowned. Whenever my folks promised me something, it always turned out to be both more and less than what I'd been led to expect. My sisters, for instance. I spent nine months carving a fraternal wimmerdoodle, and then Ma gave birth to Maisie and Dotes, twin girls. The new country looked nice enough, but I knew there would be a catch. Besides, we had plenty of grass already. My father had retired from his wild rodeo life and now lived in quiet retirement. We leased a small farm, raising mostly flowers and geese, where my father had negotiated a very reasonable price on rent. The lunatic asylum was a block away, and the intervening lot was vacant. It bothered my father that we didn't own the land outright, and my mother kept a pistol in the watering can in case one of our lunatic neighbors ever paid us a visit, but that intervening lot was great for ball plays. Don't be silly, Asterion, my mother snorted. This was a habit she'd picked up from Dad. Every member of my family lives in this town. Why, if we went west, I would never see them again in this world. My sisters, my mother... Now, wouldn't that be a tragedy? A charged look passed between my parents. Since retiring, my father has gotten to be on the largest side for a minotaur, not fat so much as robust. And now he gathered his bulk to an impressive 18 hands high. He pawed at the earthen floor. My mom liked to complain about this, dad's cloven trenches in our kitchen. Go do your gouging out of doors like a respectable animal. Asterion, my mother said, slamming the book shut, stop this nonsense at once. Ma is a plain woman with a petite human skull that calls no attention to itself, but she can be just as hot-blooded as my father. We have a life here. Outside, the sun was setting, spilling through our curtains. My father's horns throbbed softly in the checkered light. His ears, teardrop white, lay flat against the base of his skull. His expression was unrecognizable. Who was this, I wondered, this pupilless new creature? I had never seen someone so literally carried away by a desire before. All the reason ebbed out of my dad's eyes, 
replaced by a glazed animal ecstasy. If he hadn't been wearing his polka dot suspenders, you would have mistaken him for a regular old bull. And are you happy, Valina, with our life here? Have you stopped hoping for anything better? This last bit got drowned out by the five o'clock scream from the asylum, which set our blood curdling like clockwork. My mother winced, and I could tell that Dad had a wedge in the door. Why not make a fresh start of it? 600 acres, and all we have to do is claim it. You will be the wife of a very rich husband. Think of the children, all those unwed minors. Your daughters will never want for a dancing partner. Young Jacob will have a farm of his own before his 20th birthday. As Styrion, my mother sighed, she gestured around her, palms up. Be reasonable. You are no frontiersman. Where would we get the money for a single yoke of oxen? Woman, Dad boomed. It should sound like much more impressive than that, as he's the minotaur. Woman! He pushed out his flabby barrel chest. You married a minotaur. <laughs> I will pull our wagon. Oh, please, my mother rolled her eyes. You get winded during the, davy, the daisy harvest. I was still rocking in the willow chair, slurping up milk. Your husband is stronger than a dozen oxen, he roared. Dad patted his ornamental muscles, the product of flower picking and goose plucking. Or have you forgotten our rodeo days? He tusked his horns at her with a brute playfulness that I had never seen between them. Then he charged at her, herding her towards the bedroom door. And my mother giggled, suddenly shy and childlike, letting herself go limp against him. I coughed and slurped my milk a little louder, but by this time they had forgotten me entirely. We have each other, he bellowed, and everything else we will learn on the trail. I was startled by this, the speed with which one apocryphal watercolor was transforming our future. A minute ago, there had been an open book and a crazy notion. We could go or we could stay, and now, not five minutes later, the book was shut. We were going. Simple as that. We have been on the trail for over a month now. Last night, we camped on Soap Creek Bottom. Down here, it's all soft green mud and yellow bubbles of light. No potable water for our stock and barely enough for us. The weeds we suck on for moisture taste bitter and waxy. Ma's been complaining of bad headaches, and the twins have been doing most of our cooking. Basically, this means they wake up early enough to beg boiled coffee and quail eggs from the other wagons. Dotes lump some salt into the yolk, and she calls this an omelet. Apparently, my sisters still haven't mastered the pot and the spatula, that fiery alchemy whereby raw becomes food. So help me, if I have to eat another stewed apple, I am defecting to the grouse's wagon. We have joined the grouse's company at my mother's insistence. Ours is a modest wagon train, 12 families, among them the Quigleys, the Howells, the Hatfields, the Gustafsons, the Pratts, a party of eight lumber women, and a sweet, silly spinster, Olive Oatman, who is determined to be a school teacher. Olive trails the wagons on a toothless mule, each step like a glue drip. Hurry up, Olive, the men yell, and the women worry in overloud voices that she'll get lost or fall victim to Indian depredations. But nobody invites Olive to join their family's wagon. In the beginning, everybody was gushing about the idols of the open road. Look at Hebediah's kids, sitting high on the wagon. Listen to Gus, warbling on that mouth organ. Let's sleep outside, everybody. Let's close our eyes and drink in the cool, violet dune glow with our skin. But now, we spend most of our time scowling, sunk in our private nostalgia for well water and beds. It is cold and cloudy, with the wind still east. We are on a very large prairie. The few trees are stout and pinky gray, like swine, and the scrub catches at our wheel axles, as if it wants to hitch a ride with us to somewhere greener. Dad's back is carved solid, with red welts. His skin is coming off in patches. Flies twist to slow deaths in the furry coves of his nostrils. Dad shakes his head more violently with every mile, a learned tick to keep the buzzards from landing on his curved horns. We keep passing these queer, freshly dug humps of soil. Ma told Maisie and Dotes that they are just rain swells, 
and the domes of prairie dog houses. But I know better. They are graves. Nobody leaves markers here, Clem says, because there's no point, no chance that you will ever come back to visit the site. We have decided to count them, me and Clem, these tombless losses. It seems like somebody should be keeping score. Made, 22 miles, passed, seven graves. Everybody is coming to the grim conclusion that we have overloaded our wagons. Our necessities, the things that we couldn't have lived without just two weeks ago, are now burdensome luxuries. The whole trail is littered with cherished, um, I never know how to pronounce this word, detritus or detritus? Um, detritus. Heirloom mirrors, weaving looms, broken loved up dolls. Maisie and Dotes got dad's permission to pitch our grandmother's empress china set at the trees. Our mother ducked the antique pestle and cried a little bit. At dusk, we entered a tall, shadowy belt of timber. Clem spotted an orange polecat sinking into the mud, nibbling at the little hand of a giant clock face. Brass kettles glower in the shadows, and empty cradles line the sides of the road, rocking soundlessly in the wind. During the day, my mother sits on the high chair, shouting instructions at my father. Maisie and Dote sit inside, shelling peas. Both of my parents continue to implore me to ride in our wagon, but I refuse to. If my dad is sensitive to the weight of a china plate, I don't want to add one bone to his load. Instead, I walk in the back with the lumber women. I love the lumber women. They are widowed and ribald, and they sweat through their tongues like dogs. Sometimes they let me roll inside the deep tin wells of their hunger barrels. They ask lots of cheerful, impolite questions about dad, which are far easier to endure than the frank horror of other emigrant children or the veiled pity of their mothers. Your pa, they holler. He the one with the... Then they scoop the air above their temples and whistle. Woo! What a piece of luck, that, you children taking after your mother. <laughs> it doesn't feel so lucky. Most times, I wish that I had been born with a colossal bull's head. The bigger, the better. People on the trail act as if it's just as strange and even more suspicious, my seeming normalcy. We are freckled and ordinary, and it makes every mother but our own uneasy. I could be Clem's brother. My sisters look just as peachy clean as their own daughters. This seems to alarm them. They wrinkle their noses slightly in our presence, as if we are infected carriers of some hideous past. My father is doing the heavy labor, sweating through the traces, plunging into the freezing water, into rivers so deep that sometimes only the shaggy tips of his horn are visible. But he's happier than I have ever seen him. People need my father out here. In town, there was always a distinct chill in the air whenever he took Ma to birthday parties or pumpkin tumbles, barbecues especially. But on the trail, these same women regard him with a friendly terror. Their husbands solicit him with peace pipes and obsequious requests. Mr. Minotaur, could you kindly open this jar of apples for us? Mr. Minotaur, when you have a moment, would you mind goring these wolves? And I am so proud of my father, the strongest teamster, the least mortal, the most generous. Ma is too, even if she won't admit it to him. She told Louvina Pratt that he looks like the minotaur she married before he was a father. It's hard for me to imagine staring at my dad's gray belly hair and blunted horns, but I guess he was a legend once. At the early rodeos, my mom keeps all of his blue vellum posters hidden inside her Bible. He bucked every gangly cowboy on the circuit. The Pawnee gave him top billing, the Bronco with a human torso, a chipped left horn, and a questionable pedigree. Back home, people told so many stories about my father, especially those people who had never seen him perform. They said he was a sham man or a phony bull, that his divinity had been diluted by years of crossbreeding with wild cows and painted ladies. My own cousins called him a monster. I always wish they could see my dad just being my dad, covered in goose dander or pulling a wheelbarrow of poppies. Here on the trail, people are finally getting to know all the parts of him. As for my mother, things could be better. She spends most of her time gathering twigs and buffalo excrement and saying terrified prayers with the other women. 
Her face is brown and wise and like apple skin left in the sun. She looks shrunken, stooped beneath the absence of small pleasures, fresh lettuces, the seasonal melodies of geese, the anchored bed she used to share with my father. I think she even misses the asylum, its predictable madness. Ostensibly, the women meet behind the wagons to beat laundry with rocks or plate straw grass into these ugly hats. But mostly, they just make implications. Valina, you must be so proud of your husband, pulling your wagon. Luvina smiles. My Harold would never consent to walk in the traces. Yes, Valina, the Quigley sisters chorus. Why, he's just as good as any oxen. Our husbands are going to kill themselves out there, my mother snaps. All of her wrinkles point downwards, like tiny pouting mouths. It makes no difference if they are pulling or driving. We are going to forfeit every happiness we had for a bunch of empty scrub. Don't pay her any mind, my dad laughed later. We were sitting on the outskirts of the campfire, watching the other men dance around its pale flames. Dad was working ancient alluvial pebbles out of his hooves and handing them to me for my collection. They are translucent yellow, popped by lacy erosion like honeycomb. Children toddled towards our log, playing slow games of tag. The stars were impossibly bright. Valina can't see the West the way I can. Dad claims that human women are congenitally nervous and short-sighted. Like moles, son. If your mother is hungry for green corn or if her bloomers get wet from the dew, she forgets all about the future. You believe me, when we crest those mountains and your mother sees the new country, listen, everything will be different when we get there, Jacob. I promise you. That much, at least, I believe. We have lived a string of dull, thirsty weeks. Everybody is irritable and looking for someone to blame. Our wagons bump along, a pot of wooden leviathans, eaten away from the inside by mold and wood-boring mites. Our road is full of tiny perils, holes and vipers, festering wounds. Today would have been indistinguishable from the 20 before it, except that Clem and I finally got a good ball play going. As soon as we got done striking camp and picketing the horses, we went exploring. Just north of the campsite, a quarter mile downstream, we found a clearing in a shallow stand of pines. In the center, a shrunken lake, an unlikely blue, was fringed with radish reeds. Behind us, you could see the white swell of the wagon sails foaming over the trees and the sky. The sky was the color that we'd been waiting for our whole lives, it felt like. An otherworldly alloy of orange and violet, the one that meant a thunderstorm at sundown and night rain for our stills. Look, I said, pointing to the rising storm, a spider tide of dust and light. Future rain, cocooned in red filaments of cloud. Clem, you see that? My dad says that in the old days, Jacob, Clem rolled his eyes. Just play the ball, okay? Ma had insisted that we take Maisie and Dote so that they could get some fresh air, which I found infuriating, since they are girls and she'd be doing girl things, playing mumbly beans or wearing yellow ribbons, somewhere unobtrusive. Clem and I propped them up against some nearby boulders and used them as yard markers. Ready, Jacob? I swung wide, sending the ball to a delirious altitude, high above the blazing aspens. Maisie and Dotes clapped politely while Clem ran off to retrieve the ball. A second later, we heard a terrific roar from behind the trees. The aspens started quaking, and I scurried to join him. We peered through the golden leaves. Hey, Clem said. Isn't that your dad? My father was shedding his summer hide. His work shirt was hanging from a green sapling. Black fur caught like bits of cloud on the low branches. And there was my dad, rubbing his head right into a bifurcated stump, his horns sparking against the wood. Oh, he groaned, scratching harder, his back spasming with pleasure. No, I lied, that's not him. He snapped up when he heard my voice. Boys, he stamped. I felt traitorous and embarrassed for everybody. Dad preferred to take care of his animal functions in private. What are you doing out here? Hi, Jacob's dad, Clem said. We were just having a ball play with the twins. We all turned. The girls had wandered down by the lake to attend to their own functions. Maisie had unfolded the gingham curtain of modesty and was holding it up for dotes. 
When she looked over and saw us watching, she squealed and let go. The curtain of modesty went flapping off in the wind, revealing a horrified Dotes, bare-legged and squatting in the purple brush. Eee! Dotes dove behind a rock. Good Christ, my father grumbled, looking away. Get your bloomers on, Dotes. On the trail, propriety is a tough virtue to keep to, even if your curtain of modesty is made of the heaviest fabric, buffalo flannel or boiled wool. My father snatched his own thick shirt from the tree and started buttoning up. He plucked at the pink, scabby spots around his ears and neck. They startled me, these hairless patches. They looked so much like my own raw skin. He avoided our eyes. Who told you to take the girls out here, Jacob, he bellowed. Who gave you permission to leave the company? Mom did. Oh, I see. Well, he glanced at Clem, scowling through a nimbus of bull fluff. I say they go back. Then Dad trotted down to the creek to where Maisie was wringing out the sodden curtain and swept the girls up in his arms. He took long, regal strides back towards the camp, poised and paranoid, the way he walks when he suspects that he is being watched. Afterwards, we couldn't find our ball. We both sat on a log, sulking, staring into the coming storm and waiting to be called for dinner. Our bellies grumbled at the same time. A cloud of pollen floated past. Hey, Clem demanded, how come you don't look like your dad? It was spoken as a challenge, sudden and accusatory, as if we had been fighting all this while. What? But I do. I pulled up my nostrils and blew, a nasally mimicry of my father's anger. I do. How come you don't look like your dad? I tried another wild snort, but it came out sounding like a sneeze. Clem just smiled at me, aping his own parents' expression, a doughy swell of pity and smug piety. He patted my back. Poor Jacob. Bless you. That did it. I charged him with my invisible horns, and suddenly we were fighting in the dirt like animals, dunced into a feral incomprehension, kicking and scratching and biting, full of a screaming joy, hot and ugly. We kept at it until the dinner bell returned us to ourselves, and suddenly, as if by magic, we were back at the camp, gorging on buttered oats and quail cakes, full-bellied and friends again. That night I found my dad at the edge of the campfire. The company was having a barbecue, and this always makes my dad uncomfortable. The Teamsters tore into the antelope meat like savages. The men wore linen work shirts during the day, but at night they stripped to their bare chests. Then they rushed at each other, half in jest, tipping their bottles back with a taut fatigue. In the center of the corral, Olive had hiked her skirts up, drunk and merry. She was sitting on Gus's lap, slapping a tambourine against her bare knees. The wives sucked air through their teeth, flushed with scandal, clapping along all the while. Dad, will you cut my hair? Sure, son. This was our favorite ritual. He put on his reading spectacles and removed a tiny pair of scissors from his belt. Then he started cutting at my curly mop of hair. He cut with a tender precision, squinting furiously, his thick tongue lolling out of the side of his mouth. When he finished, he held the cold, flat edge of the scissors against my scalp. Can you feel your horn, son? There. And I smiled happily because I could feel them, throbbing at my temples, my skulled, secret horns, ingrown, but every bit as sharp. And I knew that no matter what Ma or Clem or anybody said, I was my father's son. We think the wolves got Olive. When the rain cleared, she had disappeared. The grown-ups all screwed their faces into identical grimaces. They tried to make their sorrow sound as genuine as their surprise. Poor Olive! Jebediah Hatfield found her mule in a ravine eight miles to the west of us, grazing on an abstemious circle of brush, its grizzled snout stained red from the berries. Torn yellow ribbon hung from the low branches. There were bits of a woman's skirt clinging to the currant bushes. My dad volunteered to lead the search party. Are you mad? Mr. Gustafson shook his bushy head. We could lose a whole day if we send a search party. At this rate, we will never make it to the new country. My dad looked from face to face, incredulous. What is wrong with you people? His horns were shaking involuntarily, no longer a mere tick, but an obvious compulsion. His voice sounded small and human. What about the contract? Before we left, we had Reverend Hidalgo officiate our wagon union. Every family had to sign a contract, 
many wheels, a single destination, all for one until the trail's end. Somebody snickered, a thin hysterical sound. The contract, Mr. Minotaur? And I flushed, seeing my dad the way the other men did, his puzzled, hairy face and his dumb cow eyes. Our company took a group conscious and most everybody agreed that it was hopeless. My father and half-blind Clyde were the only ones who voted in favor of sending a search party and Clyde later insisted that he had just been stretching. Think about it, Mr. Minotaur, Mr. Grouse said with a dark twinkle in his eye, fingering the ribbon. His cheeks were flushed as if he were telling a naughty joke. What solution could there be to this mystery? Who wants to waste half a day burying the answers? Alina, we all turned. Mrs. Grouse was squatting a few yards away, waving frantically at my mother. She reached into a rain-soaked satchel and held up one of Olive's lacy, begrimed shirts. Alina, do you want this? I think it's your size. Yesterday, my father was the last wagon but one to cross the Great Snake River. We wrapped it across in the boxes, jowl to elbow, crammed in with albino cats and babies and buckets of bear grease. The men swam alongside their oxen. Clem and I banked first, and we sat watching our fathers from the opposite shore. I didn't want to tell Clem, but I was very scared. The cows had churned up a crimson froth of silt and mud, water rising to their necks, and I lost sight of my father in the lowing melee, his ruby eyes, his chipped left horn. For a horrifying instant, I couldn't tell him apart from the regular cattle. I worried that the other men, preoccupied with their own stock, wouldn't know to help him if he went under. Do you ever worry that your pa won't make it? Clem asked carefully. His own father was struggling below us, his gum boot caught in the rapids. I mean, to the end of the trail. I shook my head. Nope. Of course he'll make it. My father is a legend. All my life, I have believed only the best parts of my father's myth. But as it turned out, this belief makes little practical difference on the trail. Dad still got the chills and had to stop and catch his breath on a small rock island. I got a fire going, and my mother knelt in the sand, wringing the water out of the furry knots of hair around his neck. She murmured something into his wet, mud-rubbed ears. I don't think it was a soothing something. Even now, they are fighting inside our wagon. Who do you think you're fooling out there, acting like you're immortal? I should have listened to my mother. I should never have married a minotaur. Ma likes to talk like she could have done much better than my father. All my aunts married postmasters and prim, mustachioed mayors. Your mother, my father snorted, between a laugh and a sneer. You women, you're all alike. It's not too late. It's never too late to turn the wagon around. Listen, Valina, my father is saying. I'm telling you, it's too late. We can only go forward. Our geese have been eaten. There are strangers living in our house. There is some wooden clattering that sounds angry and deliberate and an iron shudder and silence on my mother's end. For the first time, I feel just as sorry for my ma as for my dad. Everybody wants to go home, and no one can agree on where that is anymore. Today, we nooned in a purple grove along the dry riverbed of Snail Creek. It was cool and pleasant. After biscuits, I found a dead snake and skinned it and made a toy out of its rattler to give my sisters. They are both quarantined in the wagon, sick with ague. Their heads are swollen and bluish, like tin balloons. Maisie coughs less than dotes, but dotes is better at keeping boiled peas down. My parents haven't spoken to each other for three days. Hey, Clem, I asked him. Uh, what does your father talk about with your mother? You know, in your wagon. Huh, Clem frowned. Your folks talk to each other? He shrugged. My mother mostly bangs the pans around or folds the blankets real loudly. Sometimes they pray together. Without anybody taking verbal notice in imperceptible increments, we have slipped to the back of the company. After the third time Dad fainted, Mom quietly stepped down from the high seat and slid into the canopied box. Now, Ma refuses to drive our wagon. She curls up with the girls on a feather ticking, and she sleeps during the day. It has fallen to me now to drive my father. Every morning I wake up at dawn. The sky is still prickled with stars, and it will be a full hour before the first blue ribbon of smoke gasps up from the first campfire. I shake my dad awake 
and I help him into the traces. It's a special single yoke made to order. My father drinks a tiny glass of flame-colored liquid, his breakfast, while I clasp the collar slip around his neck and secure the nails in his crescent shoes. Then I take the reins. I'm okay once we get rolling, but I'm still uncertain, a herky greenhorn, when it comes to the commands for stopping and starting. G? Oh, I mean, ha. Sorry, Dad. Even when I close my eyes now, I see the outline of my father's back swaying in front of me, the bent, pebbled step of his vertebrae, bruised purple from the sun and toil, the shock of his bull's mane tumbling out of his hat, bleached to the color of old milk. Gus traded his mouth organ for a sock and a sack of millet, so now we travel in silence. I miss the camaraderie of that first prairie, everybody traveling with a single aim to the same place and music even on the worst days. The lighter our wagons get, the quieter our daily sojourn becomes, and the more determined we are to get there to be rid of one another. The lumber women are mute and sour, except for the hollow growl of their hunger barrels. At night, after we make camp, they break long bouts of wordlessness to ask for whiskey and matches and soda crackers and various other trail alms. Don't give them anything, Jacob, my mother hisses. Remember, if you give those women so much as a single cracker, you are taking it from your sister's mouths. Lately, my parents can't seem to agree on the value of things. Last night, well after 11 o'clock, my father trotted back to our wagon, bashful and out of breath, fresh from a barter with the local Indians. Valina, open your mouth, close your eyes. I have for you a great surprise. Then he put a raw kernel of corn on her tongue and waited, beaming, for her reaction. My mother smiled beautifully, rolling the kernel in her mouth. Oh, Asterion, where did you get this? I sold our wiffle tree, Dad said proudly. He pulled an ear of green corn out of his back pocket and, with a magician's flourish, stroked her cheek with the silky husk. You what? My mother's eyes flew open, and she spit corn in his face. You did what? Then she took hold of his horns and drew him towards her, slowly, half laughing and half crying, pressing her face against the white diamond at the bridge of his nose. You did what? Dad's nostrils flared. He lowered his head and pawed at the cake dirt. I dove into the wagon and slid beneath, be, beneath the blankets with my sisters. The candles had guttered out, but moonlight seeped through the rips in our wagon bonnet. Girls. Maisie opened one brown eye and held a finger to her lips. Dotes had her fist in her mouth, stifling a cough. I felt proud and sad that my sisters knew enough to pretend to be asleep. Outside, our parents were still arguing. Is that what we're worth to you? My mother was yelling, five dollars and an ear of green corn. Besides, you were the one who said you wanted corn. Do you even have any idea how to repair a wiffle tree? Asterion, I hope that this is some consolation to you when the wolves are gnawing on your daughter's bones. Come on, I said, loosening the cinched portal and sneaking my sisters out the back. I carried them over to the grouses, two wagons down. Hey, Clem, I said, can we sleep in your wagon tonight? No. Clem said sadly. No. My ma says that we're only allowed to be friends in church now. They think your dad gave me lice. He brightened. You can sleep under the wagon. We all peered beneath the hickory box. The undercarriage of the wagon was white and wormy. Light leaked through the planks, a palsied glow, sopped up by a dark mosaic of soil. In the dead center, the darkness pooled and shifted. My sister gasped. It was a clotted mass of dogs, Spotted dogs, yellow dogs, swimming dogs, all huddled together for warmth. You first, Maisie said. Today I was poking at the fringes of the campfire, gathering stones for my collection, when I overheard some of the other men talking about my father. The Minotaur is spreading sucking lice to the children, Mr. Grouse said, shaking in red, with a rage out of all proportion to his insect allegation. He is titillating the milk cows and curdling our children's milk. I flattened myself against the ground and inched forward. The other immigrants were frowning and nodding. Watching them, I could see the way Mr. Grouse's anger spread from man to man, the hot, viral coil of it, a warmth the men breathed in like a welcome fever. It's enough to make you hate people. I ran off to find Clem. He was out back, catching lizards behind the corral. Howdy, howdy, Jacob. Ah! I butted him in the ribs, sharply, wishing fervently that I had inherited my dad's antlered might. 
I butted him once, twice, and then stomped on his buckskin shoes. What was that for? If you don't know, I am not going to tell you. I ran off into the sunset, crying hot, frustrated tears, cursing the grasses at the top of my lungs. Then I lost sight of the wagons and got scared and ran back. I hoped very much that Clem wasn't watching. When everybody was ladling soup at the bean cauldrons, I snuck into Clem's wagon. I stole his sister's dolls, the ones the grouse girls had been making out of corn husks since Fort Charity, and ate them. In my vengative fury, I forgot to remove the button eyes, and my stomach is still cramping. I hope the West is big enough for us to really spread out. It's a terrible thought, one of my worst fears, that we are going to get there, and these people will still be our neighbors. Three nights ago, I was sleeping under my own family wagon, my bare arms and face covered in a fine cedar dust from the box, and dreaming about the most ordinary things, chalk and pillows and ceiling boards, pitchers of lemonade and gooseberry pies, when I woke to a hand, not my own, pinching at my cheek. Wake up, Jacob. I rolled over, eye level with the tip of my mother's caulked boot. I slid out from under the wagon. Ma had Maisie in one arm and Dotes in the other. Their eyes looked shiny and protuberant, their throats bulged with the echo of swallowed coughs. I felt the danger, too. I sensed it with an animal intuitiveness and froze. Come out of there, Jacob. My mother spoke in a low, careful tone. Come gather your things. Why? Circumstances have obliged us, she glanced nervously over her shoulder, to part ways with your father. I gaped up at my mother. I'd known for some time that a change was coming. I welcomed the idea of it. I wanted it, almost, or I tried to want it, like my ambivalent prayers for rain in open country. But parting ways... That was a crazy move, ghastly and extreme, like digging up coffins because we needed some wood. Jacob, she pleaded, now. We stared at each other for a long moment. I drew my blanket up around my chin, flat with panic, and wedged myself under the carriage. No. My mother bit her lip miserably. She squatted in the dust inches from my face. I could see my name, two puffs in the air. Jacob. I linked my arm around a wheel axle and glared at her, daring her to try and grab me. The spoke shifted ever so slightly, sending up pearls of sand and flint. A light came on in our wagon. Valina, is that you? With a soft, defeated cry, my mother rose to her feet. She glanced down at me a final time, pressing her hand to her cheek. Then she stumbled back towards my father's voice, the amber penumbra of our wagon. The trail is full of surprises. The following morning, Mr. Grouse announced that two wagons had deserted our party, the Quigleys and the Howells, heading back east. My mother was seated by the campfires, boiling water for porridge, and she received this news without so much as a huh, an anesthetized murmur. I waited for her to look up at me, but she just sat there staring at the bubbles. And then, just when I was at my most muddled, besieged by all sorts of flickering, waxy fears, another surprise. Through the orange transparency of our tarp, I saw my parents' silhouettes blurring together into a single monstrous shadow. I held my eye up to a hole in the cover. Dad's head was in my mother's lap. His great eyes were shut. My mother had an iron bucket and a thin, dirty kerchief. She was daubing a whitish solution of borax, sugar, and alum on the sores beneath his fur. My father was running his long, rough tongue over her boots, licking up the lichens and the toxic-colored spores. His horns scraped against our floorboards. I love you, my mother kept muttering over and over, pushing the rag into his wounds. I love you, as if she was trying to torture the true meaning out of the words. My father groaned his response. So much of what passes between my parents on this trail is illegible to me. It's as if they speak a private language, some animal cuneiform, pawing messages to each other in the red dirt. During the day, my father continues to pull our wagon. My mother hasn't spoken of that evening since. Mr. Grouse's oxen died in their traces today. They were a team, his beloved blue ribbon leaders, quick and nimble. It took three men to cut them loose. All I could focus on was the coiled rope, slick with blood, and the thought that Clem would probably not be interested in ball plays for a while. All the mothers shielded our eyes and scooted us towards the wagons. They said that the oxen had failed in the traces. 
their euphemism to protect the youngest children. This seemed a little silly to me, since everybody had to step over a big dead ox. Mom, my sister asked, making a paper daisy chain in the wagon. If I die, do you promise you'll dig a grave deep enough so the wolves can't get me? My mother looked up from her knitting with a bleary horror. Oh, sweetheart, she poked her head out the wagon. Are you hearing this, Asterion? We all looked outside to where Dad was standing in high, dun-colored grasses with the other men. They directed while he used his hooves to tamp down some perfunctory dirt over Nimble. Lately, the men's requests have grown a lot less obsequious. Just the other day, Vilner Pratt persuaded my father to wear a silver cowbell so that the company will know when he's coming. You have a tendency to sneak up on a man, Vilner shrugged, with an aw shuck sort of malice. And to tell you the truth, it spooks our women. At the sound of my mother's voice, our father looked up and waved. His horns and hide have darkened to a dull yellow gray, and the skin hangs loosely from his arms. Ma, Maisie asked, sucking on the fizzled wick of an old flare. Is dad going to fail in the traces? There was a time when my mother would have said no and reassured us with shock or laughter. These days, she leaves our hair unwashed and our questions unanswered. How should I know, Maisie? What can I know? You go and ask your father that. You go and tell your father, Ma said, her eyes glinting like nail heads, what you are afraid of. Finally, we have reached the bluffs. From up here, we can see the midway point, the alkali desert of the Great Sink. It's a tough landmark to celebrate. The Great Sink is a weird, treeless terrain. Even the clouds look flat and waterless. A dry canal cuts through the desert, a conglomerate rut, winnowed by a thousand wagons. It looks as if someone has dug out the spine of the desert. The Great Sink reminds me of home, an Olympian version of the trench that Dad used to paw in our kitchen. When I mentioned this to Ma, she laughed for the first time in many days. This patch of our journey feels like a glum perpetual noon. The lumber women are in low spirits. There is no wood for them to hack at. Suddenly, their curses sound hoarse and sincere. Wolves skulk around our wagons by day, just beyond rifle shot. Clem and I scare them off by singing hymns and patriotic ditties. Above us, the pale sky is greased with birds. Inside our wagon, Dote shivers beneath three horsehide blankets. Maisie sleeps and sleeps. Yesterday, Ma wanted us to stop, but my father was afraid of losing the company. At night, they stepped outside again to take a spousal conscience. Ma made me hold up the curtain of modesty, now soiled and tissue thin as a courtesy for our neighbors. Do you see any doctors around here? My father asked, making a big show of looking under a rock. He squeezed the rock in his fist, crushing it to powder. Any medicine? Be brave, Valina. We have to press on now. We are over halfway there. He broke off abruptly. I had lowered the curtain. My arms were tired and I had to itch my nose. Our eyes met and my father saw something in my expression that made him trot over. Jacob. His teeth were shining. He wobbled a little, his eyes were burning, his hair on end, full of a radiant, precarious cheer, like our town drunk. He touched the nick in his horn to my cheek. Don't pay your mother any mind, son. We'll get there. Have a little faith in your father. Then he picked me up and waltzed me through the ashes of our campfire. Hold on, son. He charged around and around the corral, making his shoulder muscles buckle and snap like oilcloth an impromptu rodeo. Gee, I pleaded, giggling in spite of myself. Ha! Don't let go, I yelped, even though I was the one holding on to his horns. Then Dad spun me away from my mother beyond the edge of our camp. We walked straight to the edge of the bluff. Look at that, Jacob, he whistled. Look how far we've come. Viewed from my father's shoulders, the desert stretched for eons, flat and markerless. It was an empty vista, each dune echoing itself for miles of glowing sand. A silent, windless night where any horizon could be west. The heat made me mistrustful of my own vision. I couldn't be certain if the blue smudges I saw in the distance were mountains or mirages. The wagon trains camped below us were no help. With their snubbed, segmented ends, they looked like white grubs curling into themselves, each head and tail identical. Tiny fires spangled the dark. Do you see now? 
I peered into the desert. I had no idea what my father saw out there or what he wanted me to see. Still holding on to his horns, I pivoted, slow and halting, in a direction that I desperately hoped was west. Oh, yes. My father grinned. The firelight limbed the absent places in his hide, the burn marks in his skin. Some of his bull's hair had come off in my fist. He lowered me to the ground, and then he whispered directly into my ear, as if this was a secret between men. They say the clover grows wild all over the west, Jacob. So green, Jacob, so lush and dense. So high, son, that when you wade through it, it covers your face. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. We, um, Karen has agreed to take some questions, but what we like to do here is give folks a minute or two if you need to go study for that fly or midterm that's coming up tomorrow. Why don't you do that? Uh, the rest of us can move forward and talk with Karen, ask some questions. On your way out, I'd like you to note that uh, we have a fine arts day here for high school students on March 20th. If any of you students are heading home, you know any high schoolers who might be interested in theater music and creative writing here at Aquinas, let them know about this and grab a flyer on the table. Books are for sale in the lobby, and Karen will do some uh, signings if you wish. So let's give about a minute. Yeah. Folks who want to talk, come on forward. Thank you. That was wonderful. Wow, I'm sorry, no. but then I couldn't stop. Then I was like committed. I was like, oh my yeah. God. <gasps> I'm sorry. Oh. It's a great story, though. It sustains itself. Would you like to use the handheld or and come up front? That makes me nervous. Does it? I, well, stand back there then, so we can hear you. Okay. Pop, I feel, I pop your water here. bottle I if you need it. Yeah, I feel okay. like I've handled Behind the bulletproof. Uh, okay. I'll do uh, the Phil Donahue thing, if you all remember that cultural <laughs> reference, and run around with the microphone. Um, but why don't we begin? I have a question to begin, and that is, what in the world is a hunger barrel? I made that up. I know, but what is it? <laughs> I mean, I figured you did, but tell I, us about it. I guess it. I Talk picture, well, I made like lumber women. What are those? So you were, I mean, I sometimes, sometimes there's just like this sonic joy to that. I think I just pictured these like, I, I you know, these, these thick necked, strong, you know, coarse women like rolling these barrels. Um, and something about the hunger barrel, I guess I picture just that's their food storage. That's just what they call it. Um, so and they have these deep tin, tin barrels. I have three quick questions. Do they get there? <laughs> um, and what's a pumpkin tumble? <laughs> and where did you do your research for this story? Um, so I can't answer the first one. I'm sorry. One of the reasons I break there, which was really frustrating to a lot of my my own grandfather, um, read one of these stories online. You know the whole story, and he he was like, "Those wily jerks! You gotta buy the magazine to see how it ends." <laughs> and I was like, "No, it's over." <laughs> he was like, "They're they're real smart," you know. So. For, for some reason, it, uh, to me, the story is so much about getting to this precipice. Wow. Uh, I hope they make it, um, but I, I sort of, uh, I'm sort of pessimistic about it. <laughs> um, but just sort of that, I, that, that plateau, that kind of emotional plateau. I wanted to get them there and then break there. Um, but for the, for the second one, the pumpkin tumble. The, I guess they, I read this book. That it, that's the research question too. I read this book called Women's Reminiscences of the Oregon Trail. They are not like happy reminiscences. <laughs> it's not like like a Bill Bryson kind of reminiscence. These ladies uh, are very stoic in the face of um, a rough time. And one of the things that they did was were these pumpkin tumbles, which they, they weren't even that detailed about because these are sort of like diary entries. So I'm not totally sure what a pumpkin, I imagine it's like a social gathering that involves eating delicious pumpkins or rolling pumpkins and then eating them. <laughs> but, um, it, because the, the diary entries, I guess because they're like on the Oregon Trail, so they don't have a lot, of, a lot of time to embroider, you know, so it's just sort of like child died, went to pumpkin tumble. <laughs> so I don't know what I mean. <laughs> they're pretty, uh, pretty economical uh, entries. Uh, that's where a lot of the, the names, and it's sort of, you know, if any of you are Oregon Trail historians, I apologize, because a lot of it's imagined too. But any, uh, yeah, a lot of the, um, like the, the oil seed and the, names for cloths and stuff like that was from that book. Hi. 
<laughs> this is kind of fun. Okay, is there a reason why you leave so many stories open ended? Like, you just want, like, <laughs> come on, just tell me what happened. <laughs> so, like, um, you mean so, like some of the other ones like, that are yeah, like, like haunting Olivia? Much, or <laughs> I most can think of, of pretty them much are, all of them. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I really like uh, Chekhov's stories a lot. I, those were some of the first short stories I ever read. And when I first read them, I had that same feeling of total frustration. I was like, you know, like a lady with a pet dog is one of my favorite stories. And it ends at this place, you know, that where it's essentially the ending is just sort of like, yeah, and we knew that our troubles were going to increase. And it seemed very unlikely that our romance would work. And then, you know, I was like, what? I mean, um, but something about that felt so true to me to, to break there and to end in that, that place. And so a lot of these stories, too, um, in my head, if they, if they work at all, they would work the way like a poem works a little bit. So they get you to an emotion or they gong some emotion inside you. So it's less maybe about, you know, like accident brief. I just like leave them up there. Nobody knows if they're saved or not. Maybe they're going to be saved. Um, and part of it's that I don't know if they're saved or not. You know, um, the, the more optimistic part of me would say, sure, they, they get down. But it's not really about, I guess, whether or not they're saved or not. It's about that. In that story, it's about that feeling of, um, of loss. Yeah. Um, and similarly, like uh, like with haunting Olivia, you know, it, I, I can't I can't have them. This, this is a story about this boy who's searching for the ghost of his sister. Um, he never finds the ghost of his sister, but I mean, that's that's part of a whatever emotion made me write that story has a lot to do with um, you know moving with with that moment of, of loss, I guess, with confronting the fact that that you're not gonna find your sister. With this story, anyway, that you guys just heard, I really didn't, I think everyone would have a different emotional response either way, if, if the father died or if they made it, um, you would come away from the story with just a different feeling. Um, uh, and the feeling of the story for me was sort of watching a parent deteriorate and being confronted with, um, you know, this idea, the legend of them that you've been weaned on and then the reality of the world that you're living in. Um, I don't know if that, that was kind of muddled. Um, my question is, uh, obviously your stories, like this one that you read tonight, um, are very, made from like a very fascinating, fascinating imagination, and, um, I was wondering if you could tell us, like, if you had an inspiration or, like, a mentor that, like, drove you to, dr like, write in this direction, or if it just comes from, like, your imagination itself. Oh, thank you. Um, I was not very good at sports as a kid. Um, at all. I wasn't good. I like failed at like many pursuits like tennis, piano, there's like a long list. But I was really, and I was very anxious. So I really liked to read. Um, and I was good. My parents were like, um, you keep injuring yourself and others, but you're good at sitting in the corner and imagining stuff. Go do that. So I believe that was when <laughs> I began to hone my, when I um, had like just gotten hit in the head by a dodgeball like for the 12th time and decided to read Robinson Crusoe instead or whatever. Um, but, um, I think I just read really omnivorously as a kid, like I would just eat books, um, and that was like my, my big pleasure, and I think, um, you know, I would try to write these really realistic stories, like Raymond Carver type stories, and they were just uniformly so bad, and I couldn't even say, you know, they just sounded like, um, stiff, you know, fluorescent lit, um, so somehow these sort of like more whacked out kinds of stories let me say something that felt emotionally true to me and it, you know um i think that's kind of why and also just the pleasure of like invention was was you know I, I would read um these sort of fantastic books as a kid i would read like tolkien and just want to be able to do that myself you know to create a whole world um so Um, what was your inspiration for the title of the book, or what made you choose that title? Oh, that, um, well, that's maybe my favorite story in the book. Um, and it also started out as this really terrible poem. Uh, a lot of my stories started out as, like, terrible poems or just, like, terrible, like, what-if premises, like I described to you. So I, I was doing this uh, independent study in graduate school, writing all these, like, orthopedic poems, <laughs> um, and that was one of them. I rhymed everything with lupine, uh, and it was awful. <laughs> so <laughs> I was encouraged to abandon this poem, <laughs> like on a doorstop. Uh, but the title kind of stuck with me, and it just uh, 
you know, I, I, the, the, the title and just the idea of that place stayed with me, I guess. I was wondering if you have a trick for when you can't think of any more ideas. Oh, that's never the problem. I think the problem would be that I have like too many impossible <laughs> ideas or just, um, you know, uh, ideas that aren't, that aren't gonna, it, it, the trick I think is like getting them, uh, downloading them <laughs> in a way that makes sense to other humans. <laughs> um, so, but I read, I mean, reading is great. There are people that if I'm really stuck in the writing, like I'll go and read, um, a hundred years of solitude. I don't know if you guys, that's one of my favorite books. And there's this opening passage where um, the father takes his son to see this ice. And I, that, for some reason that always uh, is helpful to me if I'm really stuck. Um, hi there. Um, I'm a big fan of mythology. And uh, one thing that I've seen recently is uh, Guillermo del Toro's movies. Yeah where, you know, Pan's Labyrinth, Hellboy, he's like, well, what if we take the idea of a satyr <laughs> seriously and, you yeah. know, put it in real life or something? Um, and so I was just wondering, with this idea of magical realism, are you using these creatures, these animals, these <coughs> nonsensical ideas, are you using them as allegories to point out something else, or are you just saying, what if we actually took them seriously? What if you give them a fair treatment? Oh, um, I think that the pleasure for me, I think, I don't know how other writers work. I never start out thinking like, I, I might not be intelligent enough to do that, thinking that I'm going to have some some um, agenda or some allegory to, to point out our foibles or whatever. Um, so so usually it is just what if. And it's sort of like the joy of being like, can I, I really want to make a world where um, it's possible that you can marry a minotaur, he can take you to the American West. You know, you, you can, he can get you to California. Um, so part of it's just that pleasure of, of, of uh, invention. But then usually what happens, or if, if, if things are working well, often it doesn't happen, is like the story will like elude my really bad ambitions for it. You know, so I'll think that I'm just writing like a, like some comic story about this minotaur and it's just gonna be like hilarious all the way through. And then, you know, um, for me, it ends up being, you know, usually some emotion will assert itself or like the plot will sort of like hub around, you know, something else. Um, but um, usually, yeah, when, when I'm starting out, it really just is the pleasure of like, what if? Kind of like, I, I imagine, I wonder if Guillermo works that way too. Um. Um, this is kind of a personal question for some authors, especially ones who are very experienced in different areas, but. Say for someone were to come up to you like just out of nowhere and ask you, what is the purpose of writing fiction, stuff that obviously hasn't quite happened, stuff that you pull out of your mind there? Right. What would you attach a purpose to for writing that kind of material? Um, well, you know, I could tell you why I read fiction, which I guess is sort of a roundabout way of saying why I would want to write it. Um, you know, I, I, read, I read to feel less alone. So especially when I was a kid, that was a huge thing to, to encounter this, this, to have this really intimate interaction with somebody else's consciousness. And these are people like Jane Austen who had, you know, I haven't been with us on this planet for a while. And it was almost just like a cold experience where, where to have something that you've, you've felt or suspected is true, you know, to have that like spine tingle that you get when you read something that feels deeply true, but that nobody else has articulated for you out loud in your life. Um, so I think that kind of connection, and that kind of connection that can really span, you know, we, I was just teaching Beowulf, and it's amazing how modern that poem feels to me. Um, so there's some charge about that that I really enjoy, like feeling like this is a truth that I have always suspected, and it's being returned to me by this author. I had no idea that I even knew this. Um, I've read this thing, and now I know it, uh, you know, explicitly. Um, so... And I, and I think also just, I mean, th there's also like an escapist pleasure, like it's a joy, the way like a film or whatever is a joy to like live in someone else's world for a while. Um, I think we have time for one more question, yeah. Karen, and then okay. people who want to sign, book signs can uh, go up and talk with Karen. Elizabeth. Hi. Um, I'm wondering if there's a particular reason why um, so many of the stories are told from a, children, or a child's point of view. Oh, I was just telling uh, John, who I don't know where he is now. Yeah, I tried for that not to happen. At a certain point when I was like, oh, I'm working on a collection. And I was like, 
oh, they're all told from the point of view of 14-year-old boys. <laughs> I'm like, well, that's weird. Um, maybe it would be good to have, you know, like a, like a woman who's a nurse or something, <laughs> like something normal and an adult. Um, and so the story I just read, I tried to tell from the Minotaur's point of view, and it was so truly just atrociously bad. It was like the worst sci-fi kind of thing you can ever imagine. Because I don't think, I wrote, I wrote a lot of these stories when I was uh, like 21 to 23, and I wasn't great at the, the terrain that felt like the most real to me still was sort of like that brink between childhood and adulthood. And that was like the green territory. So trying to imagine like my way into like a 40 year old like nurse in New Jersey, like I just couldn't do it, you know? I really, like I was like, well, we're eating pasta and having dilemmas. Like it didn't, it didn't really work out. Um, felt pretty flat. So, uh, and that was just the voice that told me the stories. And I, I try to do third person voices because I sometimes first person can feel kind of claustrophobic. Um, and that was just, that was the voice that I could like joke in or invent in. And, um, I think that's changing a little bit now, but at that time, I, anytime I would try to like detour and do, do an adult story, I, I would find my way back to that. There's, there's sort of like a, a similar voice to a lot of them, um, and that was just what I was working in at the time. All right, let's give Karen another thank you. Thank you guys so much for having me. That was a pleasure. Tomorrow, 12.30.